So um, if I can get your attention, I um, wanted to welcome everybody. I'm Bob Kaplan. I'm the director of the Office of Behavioral and Social Sciences Research. And it's a pleasure to, um, to welcome everybody to the Matilda Riley Lecture. Uh, many of you know Matilda Riley was a very important person in, at the NIH. Um, our office, the Office of Behavioral and Social Sciences Research, owes a lot to Dr. Riley because she was perhaps the most important and influential person in getting behavioral and social sciences recognized at the NIH. We like to say that um, the um, behavioral and social sciences at NIH have really gained a foothold in the last few years. So depending on how you estimate uh, the expenditures, we're up to about three and a half billion dollars per year that are spent on behavioral and social sciences research in the NIH portfolio. But it hasn't always been that way. And it owes to a large extent to people like Matilda Riley, who uh, championed the cause, who pulled people together, developed the Behavioral and Social Sciences Coordinating Committee, and engaged in a lot of other activities to bring us to where we are today. Dr. Riley, interestingly, was born 100 years ago. She was born in 1911, and she passed away in 2004. Uh, and since 2006, we've been uh, giving the Memorial Matilda Riley uh, Award each year. And that some very distinguished people, I won't bore you with all the previous recipients, but some of the most distinguished uh, people in our field have received this honor in the past. This year, uh, our recipient is John Cassiopa, and who, uh, who you'll hear from in just a minute. Um, but I wanted to tell you a little bit about John as uh, an introduction. Um, John is the Margaret um, I'm sorry, Tiffany and Margaret Blake, distinguished professor at the University of Chicago, and he's also the director of the University of Chicago Center um, for Cognitive and Social Neuroscience. He has done all kinds of remarkable things in his career, and again, you're going to hear from him, so I won't go into all of this in detail, but it's worth saying that he's done some of the most creative work that's really genuinely border crossing, that he uh, was trained as a psychologist, he's doing uh, cognitive and social neuroscience, and he has taken on very interesting problem areas. He's become very interested in the problem of social isolation, and he studied this using a wide variety of methodologies, and has shown that that perceived social isolation, and the sense of, of uh, what some people call loneliness, has important cognitive, hormonal, uh, and um, motivational aspects to it. He also has interpreted his data uh, from an evolutionary perspective and shown that this sense of social isolation is motivational and actually may be related to uh, the continuation of the survival of the species. So I won't really go into a lot of the detail of John's talk because that, of course, he can do it so much better than I can, but it is worth saying that um, sometimes we're a little bit slow here at the NIH on catching on to things. Uh, you might be surprised to learn that we are not the first ones to uh, honor John Cassiopo. And I will just mention uh, a few of the previous awards that he's received. Uh, he's received the NIH Merit Award, the Distinguished Scientific Contribution Award from the American Psychological Association, the Campbell Award for Distinguished Scientific Contributions to Personality and Social Psychology from the Society of Personality and Social Psychology, the Award for Distinguished Scientific Contributions to uh, Psychophysiology from the Society for Psychophysiologic Research, the Trolland Award uh, from the National Academy of Sciences, the Scientific Impact Award from the uh, Society of, for Experimental Psychology, the President's Citation from the American Psychological Association, the Theoretical Innovation Prize from the Society for Personality and Social Psychology, the Award for Distinguished Service on behalf of Personality and Social Psychology from the um, Society for Personality and Social Psychology, the Distinguished Mentor Award from Psychi. He's received an honorary Doctoral of Science degree from Bard College. And by the way, there's an another half page here, so maybe I won't read all of them, so I, it will give him enough time to speak. But I will say that uh, he's a fellow of 16 different scientific organizations. He's a past president of several of these, including uh, the Association for Psychological Science and the Society uh, for Psychophysiologic Research and the Society for Personality and Social Psychology. He's also the current chair of this section of the American, uh, I'm sorry, he's the current, um, pre 
current president of uh, the Society for uh, Neuroscience. So with all of this, it's really a great honor to introduce John and to go with all of his other awards that he's received. Uh, we would like to present John uh, with this uh, special award that he can put up on, on his desk along with all the others. So by the way, and John is also a really good guy. So <laughs> anyway. <laughs> Thank you for joining me this afternoon, and thank you very much for the award. Um, I read about Miltilda White Riley after hearing about this award, and I have to tell you, just having one's name associated with someone of that importance and stature is a, is a really great honor, so thank you very much. Uh, I'd like to talk a little bit today about uh, something I hope you'll find interesting, um, and that's social isolation, and I want to back up and talk about just life more generally. Uh, there's an NSF Project of Life um, initiative that was started about five to seven years ago. And the idea is to try to identify as many species on Earth as possible. And at least at the start of the project, two million species had been identified. And the estimates were that there were anywhere from five million to 100 million species on Earth. So that, that error band gives you some idea of how little we know just even about life on Earth. And if you look, there are two kind of design features that dominate. Uh, one is that species are born sufficiently able to ambulate and to find food and defend themselves at birth that they don't need a lot of caregiving. Uh, the other is that they're born in such large numbers, bacteria is a case in point as well, they're born in such large numbers that some survive to reproduce. And that design feature has worked well over the eons. Uh, some Species are social, some are not social. These are sardines being predated by this particular shark. And as you know, sardines are social in the sense that they swim around in schools. And when they find themselves predated, they create these dynamic fish balls. And they, these fish balls, although they look highly chaotic, seem to have a mind for, of their own. Where is that mind? Well, if you take little ovals on your computer desktop, and you program all of them so that they swim to the middle or move to the middle, you can simulate a fishbowl. And that is, this is selfish behavior. It's dangerous on the social perimeter. That's where predators can easily pluck you off. So those who actually had the impulse to swim to the middle were more likely to survive, and therefore those genes were generated and uh, became characteristic of that species. And of course, that led to this postulate, whatever the contributions made by a gene or set of genes to an organism structure and function are passed on to the next generation, if and only if the genes make their way to the gene pool. Of course, this was popularized by Dawkins' 1975 book, The Selfish Gene. There were a number of articles that followed, basically supporting Darwin's notion that there's this um, impulse to, uh, for the most powerful to survive, survival of the fittest. Now, in fairness, although that was the notion, Darwin, of course, didn't know about genes, but this survival of the fittest notion dominated origin of the species, Darwin was nevertheless bothered by what he observed that seemed inconsistent. And in The Descent of Man, as many of you know, he wrote a lot about mutual aid and how mutual aid seemed to be disconfirmatory of his, his other premise. In this, in fact, he argued a tribe including many members who, from possessing a high degree of the spirit of patriotism, fidelity, obedience, courage, and sympathy, were always ready to aid one another and to sacrifice themselves for the common good would be victorious over most other tribes, and this would be natural selection. This, of course, led to the notion of group selection, which became promiscuously applied in biology in the first half of the 20th century, and in fact, until 1966, when a graduate student at the University of Chicago by the name of George Williams wrote this scathing critique and group selection became a taboo notion for 50 years. Well, there's now multi-level selection theory uh, that's coming back. And so in very specific circumstances, it seems the, these um, beneficial effects of group-related processes actually outweigh individual, although they're not nearly as prevalent as was originally thought. Just to give you, though, one example, um, how many saw March of the Emperor Penguins? Good, so I can keep this very short. You know that the, the, they live by the sea, they march through the middle where there's very few predators who are willing to weather the minus 70 degree temperature. 
uh, winters and the very strong up to 100 mile per hour winds. Uh, the mother births the chick, the father places it on the abdominal fat, the mother goes back. So the mother's necessary but not sufficient for the survival of the genes, but of course neither is the father. The winter is so um, rigorous, so demanding that they would all perish if they didn't create this huddle. And if you notice, they're sitting there with their back to the winds and uh, for the most part they sleep. But they also appear to appear to voluntarily or cooperatively take turns on the outside. If it really was survival of the fittest, only the stronger in the middle and the weakest on the outside, that outer rim would perish, then the next rim, the next rim. So there's been this kind of evolutionary development of a rotation scheme, and that huddle is also a vehicle for genetic reproduction. Without that huddle, the genes wouldn't survive. So the mother and father are necessary, but neither alone would be sufficient. Now if we look at, if you will, the 20th century, there was this focus on the individual. I'm a product. I, you know, I finished my degree in the mid-70s, and so you know, we all studied even social processes by putting individuals in a cubicle by themselves where we could control all possible confounding forces. Now, it's easy, thank you, it's easy to forget when we have that kind of focus that social species, by definition, create superorganismal structures. That's what it means to be a, a, a social species. If one wants to study what are the effects of those structures, I mean, these structures evolved hand in hand with cellular, hormonal, neural, and genetic mechanisms to help us survive, prosper, care for our offspring long enough so that they too survive. Because in the case of mammals, where our offspring have abject dependency periods, it's not enough just to reproduce. If we simply reproduce, we may have a lot of dead offspring, right? So we also have to nurture them in order for our genes to make it to the gene pool. So kind of the simple way of saying that is whether our genes make it to the gene pool depends on whether you have grandchildren, not whether you have children. All right? So we're, we in mammals are a little different than those that I started with. And the, you know, the question is, well, what, what is the impact of these kinds of structures on one's survival? And we took some time ago now, and thanks greatly to NIH funding, NIA in particular, we took the approach of the neurosciences. If you want to know what a particular gene does, you look at mice with that gene and mice without that gene. If you want to know what the orbital frontal cortex does, you look at Phineas Gage before and after a tamping iron decimates the orbital frontal cortex. So our approach was if we want to know what these social connections that define us as a social species is doing, we can look at individuals with and without those social connections. And so that's how we got into this area of research. Um, this is a, a 19... 88 science paper by House Landis and Umberson, three epidemiologists, socio-epidemiologists from ISR in Michigan. And you all are probably familiar with this. What it shows is broad-based morbidity and mortality is greater in individuals who are isolated than those who are integrated. Okay? Now, we've looked at these data, and this, I have to admit, caught my attention as well. And the primary mechanism responsible for this effect that was espoused in this paper and in fact, in the literature at, the, at that point in time, was what was called the social control hypothesis. If you're highly integrated, family and friends are more likely to encourage you to take care of yourself. I mean, you need to get a little sleep, you're working too long of hours, maybe you should stop smoking, you're looking heavy, go out and get some exercise, don't drink so much. We all know health behaviors have big effects on morbidity and mortality. It made a nice, convenient, simple story. It's also the case that in the uh, mid to late, to, well, mid to three quarters of the 20th century, the social scientists and the biological scientists weren't exactly friends. The biological scientists were of the opinion that social factors were kind of late on arrival, and so it had very little to do with basic structure and function, and even if they did, they were too complicated to understand. The social scientists, on the other hand, the kind of the notion espoused in the mid to two-thirds, three-quarters way through the 20th century was, you know, it may be that biology is underlying social behavior, but it's too complicated to understand, maybe in a thousand years, but we've had two great wars, a depression, and social injustices. We don't have the luxury of worrying about that. So there was this divide, and the social control hypothesis was convenient because it allowed the social and behavioral scientists to just deal with social and behavioral factors alone and not think about the biology. Well, one of the things that bothered me when I read the paper was being both a bio and a social psychologist, I knew what the animal literature on isolation had shown. This is just a, a kind of some of the recent. Uh, if you isolate a fruit fly, it dies earlier. It dies earlier because of oxidative stress. Right? If 
you look at, um, this is actually my, my postdoc did this study. Um, if you use an experimental mouse model of stroke and you put a needle into the brain uh, and that mouse is individually housed or group housed, that infarct grows three times larger and the mouse is more likely to die if it's individually housed than group housed. That's true of every social species that's been tested. They die earlier. They show signs of morbidity. Now, I doubt the fruit fly, the mouse, the rat, the rabbit, the dog is showing these effects because spouse and friends encouraging them to go see the physician. And it's just likely not to be operating in that fashion. So suggesting that there's some direct biological process operating as well. And so this got me very interested in using isolation as a mechanism for studying what are the biologic effects. The second thing that we've learned is we know it's the brain that's involved because when we look at objective isolation, either measured as House Landers and Emerson, or Lisa Bergman and colleagues have looked at it, or as just the frequency of contact. Well, are they alone? Are they not alone? We find it's the perceived isolation that's actually more important, not the objective isolation. Now, I actually think there's an evolutionary reason for that that I'll talk about in a few minutes. But what I found myself studying was something that the psychological literature had called loneliness. And the characteristic of loneliness at that point in time was that it's this gnawing chronic disease without redeeming features. Now, I'm going to argue that there's many beneficial features of loneliness. And just to presage some of what I'm going to be saying, it's the stick of the carrot and stick that compels us to be humane, to be connected to other individuals. If it hurts to be disconnected from people, then you're more likely to value that connection. All right? Now, third reason that we question the house landers and numbers some result uh, is actually exemplified in this, this recent study that we did using the health and retirement study. In 2002, uh, thanks to NIA funding, a loneliness question, questionnaire was put into one module of the HRS, and we used those data to look at, just like house landers and numbers some morbidity and mortality uh, over the next six year period. And what you see is loneliness in 2002 predicting significantly who died over that six year period. Now, we enter uh, features of the social network. And you see that's not changing the odds ratio of loneliness. We find, for instance, marital status to be related to health. This we've done with Linda Waite, who's the originator of looking at the kind of the health benefits of marriage. And we find that health benefits in marriage are twofold. Higher income, because you have joint incomes, and you feel less lonely. If you take those two things out, there isn't a health benefit to marriage in most, most of the measures, that, including mortality. Uh, here's the exercise very, and, and other health behaviors. You see, they have big effects. Notice, though, when you add health behaviors, you're barely lowering the odds ratio at all, and it remains statistically significant. So it's not that health behaviors aren't important. Of course they are. But health behaviors are operating through a different route than this feeling of isolation and in the standard demographic factors. All right? Okay, so what's the kind of general model that I'm going to be arguing? Well, you've seen part of it. Genes that promote behavior which increase the odds of the gene surviving are perpetuated. Simple enough. The second is that when offspring have periods of long periods of dependency, selfish genes incline social brains and bonds. Again, think about the penguins. It wasn't the individual behavior. It was the huddle that was responsible for those genes making it to the gene pool. Humans have much more flexible groups. That's a fairly stereotyped superorganismal structure that gets uh, created and, and dissipates at given points in time. We create occasions like today when the individuals in this room are unlikely to ever be in the same room again, and yet we can share common ideas. Finally, perceived social isolation or loneliness evolved as an aversive biological signal. Come on in. There's room. <laughs> well, welcome. Thank you. Of course. Sorry. That's fine. Thank you for joining us. Okay, so very much like hunger, pain, and thirst, we've conceived loneliness as this aversive biological signal that promotes vigilance for assaults that threatens one's short-term survival, what's sometimes in the animal literature called predator evasion, and opportunities for the social connection necessary for one's long-term survival. So we have both this short and long-term effect. <laughs> oh, and it's time for the Riley lecture. <laughs> well, I'm glad to be reminded of that. Just a second. I've got multiple reminders of it. <laughs> well, you see my instructions there. <laughs> John, I don't have anybody calling you up socially to remind you. 
<laughs> yes, yes. Well, that's why I have iPhones and computers, right? Okay, let's go through this again. Now, we turn the page because we've looked at some of the psychological consequences of that little model. And so I want to just start with perceived isolation. Now remember, this is, this is the exception rather than rule. If you look at the distribution of loneliness, it's just like hunger, thirst, and pain. Most people aren't lonely. It's the exception rather than the rule, all right? But when they're isolated, we're arguing there's this motivation to connect, but also this implicit hypervigilance for social threats. And that's there because being rejected by a group, being an outcast of a group, is also a dangerous circumstance. You might want to push your way back in, but that can be dangerous. If you have ever sat, as I have, waiting to be selected on a sports team, and everybody else was selected, you know, kind of pushing your way in doesn't serve you well, all right? So there's this attentional, confirmatory, and memory bias that results from this implicit hype for vigilance that leads to behavior that brings about the very things that you worried about. Come on through. It's all right. Uh, we call it a self-fulfilling prophecy as well. <laughs> that leads to more negative displays of social interactions and affect. And so, of course, you're now interacting with others in a negative fashion. And that produces uh, consequences that can be reinforcing, leading to greater feelings of isolation. If one maintains this cycle, that then has neurobiological consequences that we're going to review. And I would argue earlier morbidity and mortality, as we showed in that slide just a few times ago. Now, you might say, why would this evolve? And I think there's a variety of reasons. But one is that just like hunger, thirst, and pain, it's not good to remain in any of those states. But having those as the first signal that motivates you to reconnect with caution is actually quite adaptive for us. The second, I've used this slide to capture. And that is, the, the evolution of this aversive reaction gives us a capacity that most species don't have. You know, we have many fewer genes than we were, quote, supposed to, given the complexity of our behavior. And one of the questions is, why do we have so few genes? What's unique about us? And it was, we have more neurons. No, we don't. Not than chimps when you correct for body size. We, had, we seem to have more white matter. There seem to be more connections. And we have more, the synapses are capable of more complex information transfer. And the connections with other people increases information complexity and transfer. That seems to be with, where the real value is. And in that last component, in terms of social learning. And what something like gets epitomized in time out does is it allows us to train an individual new to a social context in the specific norms of that particular group, no matter what era or what culture. So what is this, right? Well, you, if a child is doing something that is what? Counter to what is good for the group. If they're acting selfishly, that's typically the reason we put them in time out. One minute per year, you put them aside. In fact, preferably not in the room where they have their toys, but in the same room, they're just not allowed to interact. What do they do? Well, they show expressions like this. And if you think about it, if you have to now be vigilant but want to reconnect, but be vigilant about possible threats, depression is a terrific affective response to it. First of all, it diminishes your likelihood of having the energy to pound your way back in. That's helpful to you. Secondly, it's associated with visible and auditory signals that say, if there's anyone around who's willing to reconnect, please do so now. If you've ever put your <laughs> child, if you put your child in time out, you know it's actually hard to leave them there one minute per year of life because they look and sound so sad. <laughs> so those of us who've managed to try to do that, and my wife was more able to do it than I was, but those who have been able to manage, right, you bring them back into the group, you embrace them, and what do they do as a result? They act less selfish. They act more in keeping with the norms of the group. Oh, this is a pretty remarkable capacity. It has a great advantage in terms of shaping productive members of a particular social group. All right? So that's kind of the overarching model. One of the perhaps more ridiculous components of that model is that you have this implicit hypervigilance for social threats. Sounds very Freudian. Right? And what's really great about it, since it's implicit, we can't test it, except we can. And to test it, we use the Stroop task. And many of you know the Stroop task, and it's really very easy. The instructions are, read the color. Tell me what the color is of the letter strings. Uh, they're going to spell out words. That you don't have to read the words. That's irrelevant. I just want you to tell me the color in which the letter strings appear. And you look at this, and you go, stunningly simple, blue, orange, green, red, right? And then we present something like this, and they go, but, 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 because there is this 
fact, your brain's reading the words even if you don't know you're trying to read the words, okay? So we use the Stroop test to test whether your brain is also on alert for implicit social threats. And we did that by showing these words, not the ones on the left, all right? And so we used negative words, negative social words, non-social words. And we just took the difference in response latency of those two. And we took positive, and we did the same thing. Now, in fact, they were matched for word frequency and word length and number of syllables. These are just the ones I could remember sitting, sitting in a hotel room making this slide. But we used many such words. And then we simply correlated the differences in response latency to name the colors uh, with loneliness. We've now done this four different times, and in every single study, we get the same result. If I break it down by negative social, negative non-social, it's the negative social words that are slowing people down. The lonelier you are, the longer it takes to say whatever color the reject was in, the color of the negative social words. It's not true of emotional words or social words generally. Notice there's no such effect on positive words. All right? A second way in which we've looked at this implicit threat notion is to do some brain imaging and same kind of experimental design. We have a lot of negative social pictures and negative non-social pictures. And we're simply going to take the difference in the hemodynamic response and all the voxels constituting a brain area. Uh, and, and we now have that contrast. We have 20 such subjects in this study. And you can effectively think of it as I have these hemodynamic responses, the bold signal in each voxel, and I have their loneliness score in all of the voxels. And I have these two arrays of brains. And I simply convolve those arrays to see our matrices to see how is it that the lonely brain differs from the non-lonely brain in response to negative social versus non-social pictures. And that's what you see here. This is the back of the brain visual cortex. The orange means there's greater activation in the lonely than non-lonely brain when looking at negative social pictures. Now I might point out these were equally visually complex, they were equally arousing, and they were equally negative based on both lonely and non-lonely individuals' ratings. And yet you see greater visual cortical activity presumably reflecting greater attention to the negative social pictures, right? Again, if your brain is on alert for negative social threats, a negative picture makes you worry about your own survival. Maybe not explicitly, but that's basically what we argue is going on. Well, as you follow this visual stream forward, you get to the blue area. That blue area is bilateral, and it's also called the temporal parietal junction. The temporal parietal junction has been associated with, do you want to walk through? There's a chair up here. That's all right. Are you sit next to Dr. Hodas? Yeah, I wouldn't either. He's just a little intimidating. Okay, so what you see here is this TPJ area activated in non-lonely greater than in lonely. This area is associated with theory of mind. It's associated with respective taking. Basically, it's associated with anything that requires a, a, attentional control, such as the attentional control that allows you to take your attention from inside of your head and maybe take Dr. Kaplan's point of view about how this is going, all right? The lonelier you are, the less likely you are to do that when you see a negative social episode. Again, if you feel isolated, it's your self-preservation that you're more concerned about. A negative picture brings that self-preservation motive to the front, and so you see less activation of the TPJ. We did the same thing with the positive, and you see a very different area active Notice it's blue, which means it's more active in non-lonely than lonely individuals centered in the ventral striatum area. This is the dopaminergic area of the brain, a rich reward area of the brain. Yes, indeed, non-lonely people show a stronger reward response to social pictures than to equally pleasant and arousing non-social pictures. Now, interestingly, lonely and non-lonely people are rating these pictures the same. But imagine, if you will, just to put this in context, you're sitting at dinner with your spouse or a significant other, and you see a lovely, happy couple walk in. You know it's a pleasant occasion for them, right? You know that's a pleasant picture, in a sense. Whether you feel joy really will depend on whether you adore your significant other sitting across the table or you're having a fight <laughs> with them. And that's exactly what we're seeing here. Now, the interesting thing is that we see this outside of the magnet as well. So this is how the uplifts and hassles felt by lonely and non-lonely young adults as they go across their normal days. And what you see is that the uplifts and hassles do not differ across the lonely and non-lonely young adults, but the hassles are rated as more severe and the uplifts are rated as less uplifting by lonely individuals, right? Very much like what you're seeing in these particular brain images. How do we know it's loneliness? 
I mean, loneliness doesn't travel alone in, in this journey. And so what I have here uh, is the top and bottom quintile of two years worth of incoming Ohio State freshmen. So we have about 5,500 students in this sample. And you see that they differ in loneliness. Yeah, by definition, that's the top and bottom quintile. We did exclude students who were from uh, non-US countries. So these are only US citizens um, because a lot of, in fact, distance from home is a predictor of loneliness. And as you start to cross oceans, it increases a lot. So we eliminated only, uh, we eliminated anyone not from the US. But you see they differ in social support, they differ in shyness, social skills, anger, anxiety, self-esteem, fear of a negative evaluation, and mood and optimism. All of these are significant. Some don't look like it simply because I put it on a common scale because I want, to, I want you to see what I'm going to compare this to. But these are two completely different groups of people. And in fact, when I first started this research, I worried that what we were looking at was lonely kids. These isolated kids felt isolated because they were the least popular. They had the least social capital to offer in the first place. They were shorter, they were heavier, they were less attractive. So we quantified all of that, and I'm happy to say none of that was significant or even approach significance, all right? So it's not that. In fact, um, some of the things we found is that billionaires are stunningly lonely. Billionaires. They have lots of people who want to be their friend, but they all know that the people who want to be their friend have some other motive. And so they feel terribly isolated despite that. So you can see why physical attractiveness, for instance, might have more network members, but they don't feel less lonely on average. So how do we know it's loneliness? Well, we've used four different methods. One is we use statistical controls. So we measure all of that as those at NIA who've worked with us over the last 10 years know. We, work, we measure all of these in our studies and we statistically control for them. Uh, we do experiments where we can. Uh, some of the effects, in fact, I'm gonna show you the results of an experiment in the next slide. Uh, if we're looking at short-term effects, experiments are great. We randomly assign people, we make one group feel lonely, the less, less lonely, and we can look at the results. However, if we're looking at broad-based morbidity and mortality, not a good idea. And so for that, we do longitudinal studies. And the Chicago Health Aging Social Relations, and now a, a, a sister study to that, uh, allows us to talk about people uh, since 2001 now uh, who have been born uh, since 1935. Um, and so we have a nice wide age range we've been able to follow for a number of years. And most of the data I'll be presenting today are, in fact, from that particular group. And in these longitudinal studies, we do structural equation, cross lag, panel analyses with covariates. And basically what we do is we test alternative interpretations. So an experiment, because we can randomly assign, we take care of a lot of alternative interpretations. But as all of you know, you can make causal inference, but you've got to make sure there's not some potential confounding variable that's accounting for it. Well, with cross lag longitudinal, you can basically do the same thing except you have to worry about all the things you haven't randomly assigned. So you look at all the possible alternative interpretations. Is it hostility? Is it social support? Is it extroversion? Is it neuroticism? And you can fit all of those into these statistical models and test all of them, as long as you've measured them, and we have. And if you reject all the others, you're left with the most plausible explanation being perceived isolation. And so that's the approach that we take here. And then, of course, animal models were possible. And again, thanks to NIA funding, we have now developed a rhesus monkey model uh, in which we're going to start doing actual isolation of, the, of these primates. But here's an experiment that we did, and this actually caught my attention uh, perhaps more dramatically than any result we've seen, because I at this point in time still was of the ilk of everybody else who had thought about loneliness, and that it was, it was just kind of a, one of these affective qualities. I didn't have the biological perspective I started with in this talk, that it really is something important as Robert said in his introductory comments that contributes to our being exactly the kind of species we are. So these are in fact the same 20 individuals, hypnotized and made to feel lonely or non-lonely. David Spiegel did the hypnosis. Uh, I was in a MacArthur network at the time with David Spiegel and Steve Coslin. David and Steve had just published a Lancet paper on these 20 individuals showing that when shown, these are high hypnotizable, they also had a low hypnotizable, when they were shown color or black and white art, crossed with that, told they were looking color or black and white. The high hypnotizables showed brain reactions commensurate with what they thought they were looking at. Low hypnotizable, it was what they were looking at. That was the most compelling study of hypnosis I had seen. I'm not a big believer in hypnosis, so we used the same 20 high hypnotizable subjects and David did the hypnosis. And so they were hypnotized, they then filled out these scales, kind of balanced order, which was made to feel lonely or non-lonely first. We brought them out, 
put them back into the opposite state, they filled out the surveys. Again, I have not played with these axes. The similarity and absolute values stunt me. All right? Now, this suggests that loneliness has a lot of others in the bus, but it's the driver. It's much more central as a trait than any of us appreciated it being. And this is when we actually got serious about thinking in an evolutionary and biologic sense, why is this such an important variable? Well, I've suggested that loneliness is related to depression. In fact, at the time we started this research, many thought loneliness was nothing other than depression. And indeed, in year one of the Chaser study, you find this correlation between loneliness and depression. Of course, we would expect it, but from, uh, from a cross-sectional, you can't tell which is causing what. So, of course, when you look across a five-year period, you can start to parse that. There's lots of covariates here. So you've got all the demographics, all the standard biologic risk factors, and we have psychosocial factors. In this particular model, I'm showing perceived stress. And what you see is that loneliness over time is leading to higher rates of depressive symptomatology year by year. Using, cross, uh, uh, using a case-based matching, we know that this effect is, in fact, two years. It's a, perfectly, it's a highly correlated effect, but the effect of loneliness impacts depressive symptomology for, for an extension of two years. Depression is not leading to increases in loneliness when you control for these factors. Without the covariates, it looks like it's reciprocal. With the covariates, it's not reciprocal. It's unidirectional. Well, there was a third way in which I tried to get at this implicit process, and I thought, if loneliness is actually causing the brain to go on alert for social threats, then it should penetrate the nights. And it can't be the person's intentions because they're sleeping. And if you think about it from an evolutionary point of view, this makes sense. If it's dangerous, if it's hard to survive, standing alone with a stick in your hand, defending yourself against wild beasts, Think of how dangerous it is to lay that stick down to go to sleep at night with wild beasts out and you don't have a safe social surround. And so does loneliness penetrate the night? Does it, if you will, diminish the salubrity of sleep? Well, in our undergraduates, we had them in the hospital. We simply measured their sleep one night in the hospital and five nights in their dorm room. And what we saw was more micro-awakenings in our isolated kids, in our lonely kids. Right? Now, um, there was a little bit more uh, awake time after sleep onset, so they awaken. But most of this are what are called micro-awakenings. Um, if you have a spouse or a significant other with sleep apnea, you're usually the one who tells the spouse they have, they have something like sleep apnea because they're completely unaware that they stop breathing, kind of startle, and then they fall back asleep. That's really what's characterizing, not quite that dramatically, but that's what's characterizing the lonely kids here. Uh, we did this in the Chicago Health Aging Social Relations, the Chaser study as well. Um, we used uh, the Pittsburgh Sleep Quality Index in both the undergraduate study and in the longitudinal study. Uh, I showed you the objective data from the undergraduate. Uh, most of this differed in the undergraduates as well. All of it differs in our older adults. I find curious particularly this one. Lonely older adults are also taking more sleep medications. They're trying to do something about it. It's just not overcoming, if you will, the, uh, the disruption. This is a longitudinal. Now this is a chaser study, but we're looking night after night in the same individuals. Loneliness is predicting daytime dysfunction, how tired they are the next day. How tired they are isn't predicting uh, how lonely they feel the next day. Now I want to remind you, these are not your PIs writing grants. I know some of us have had enough sleepless nights. I'm sure it predicts social behavior the next day. Evan Carter and I were talking about this kind of design. We were both convinced but then, of course, when we go on sleepless nights right before grant periods, it's more extreme than you see in our normal population. So these are normal people, not PIs or NIH staff. <laughs> we then asked, oh, now, wait, look, one of the things I should point out is that we're all aware that depression is associated with sleep disruptions, right? So we have depressive symptomatology in here as a covariate, and it's not accounting for the result. And, you know, I'd like to go back and see what the depression sleep disorders, how much of that's depression and how much of that is loneliness. And we just don't know. There is increasingly, though, others around the world, two recent papers this year, one from Arizona, one from Finland, saying that the effects of social support are, in fact, mediated by loneliness. And that's what we have found as well. Um, this is a study uh, of the Hutterites using wrist actigraphy. The reason we went to the Hutterites was that all of the data I've shown you are from people who live in urban areas, right? And I have this evolutionary story I'm telling you. And there's a big disconnect between urban environments and the, and the evolutionary context. 
the Hutterites aren't exactly evolutionary, but they're certainly more agrarian, very connected, close-knit, small group. And I have to say, the overall level of loneliness is lower in this group than we've seen any place in the world. Even though that's the case, you can see the data here, loneliness is associated with more, if you will, sleep fragmentation as measured by wrist actigraphy, if you will, more micro-awakenings. And so it doesn't seem to be limited to kind of the urban uh, population. Well, what about autonomic processes, in particular cardiovascular processes? Cardiovascular disorders are the remain the primary cause of, of death. And so we looked early uh, at that process. This is from the undergraduates. Undergraduates are going to be norm normal intensive, but they show differences in vascular resistance. That's measured here, baseline, um, while preparing a, a speech and then delivering the public speech. Uh, cardiac output is the other component of blood pressure. And of course, if you get increases in vascular resistance, you're going to remain normal tensive. You show a decrease in cardiac output. That's exactly what you see here. But what's interesting to me is that there is a main effect. There isn't an interaction. There isn't greater stress reactivity in lonely individuals. They simply show greater vascular resistance, which is particularly sensitive to perceived threat. There's greater vascular resistance as a main effect. They're in the state as a, just a way of being when they awaken as they go through the course of their days. So this is not the traditional stress reactivity story. It's, a, if you will, a different kind of stressor, an implicit stressor uh, of a particular kind. Uh, this is, again, our undergraduates. What we did in the morning, what, so they awakened from the hospital uh, night. Uh, we took off the sleep cap. We put on an ambulatory impedance cardiograph and an ambulatory blood pressure device and gave them a beeper, and they were sent out during the course of their day. They were beeped randomly nine times during the day, sat down, filled out a diary about who they were with, what they were doing, uh, and we obtained cardiovascular measurements. And you see their normal tensive as they go around in their normal day. Uh, they show a higher vascular resistance and lower cardiac output in their normal day as well. So it's not, if you will, a white coat hypertension or vascular resistance effect. If that's the case, then vascular resistance is a predictor of who develops hypertension. That was one of the Framingham study findings. And so the expectation is by the time we look at chasers, lonely individuals should have higher blood pressure. And here in year one, in fact, they do. But that doesn't mean that loneliness is causal in any way. So of course, we do the same kind of longitudinal structural equation cross-lag modeling with lots and lots of covariates, both psychosocial and standard biological risk factors and demographics are in there. And what you see is after about three or four years, loneliness now predicts increases in blood pressure. It's accruing over that time. It's just blood pressure is a regulated physiological endpoint. It's not like depressive symptomatology with no breaks whatsoever on it. So it takes a while, and here the regulatory mechanisms are starting to decay, so it takes a few years for you to actually see a statistically significant effect. The effect size is about 0.6 millimeters of mercury per year per standard deviation of loneliness. I'm told that's about the effect size of statins. Neuroendocrine mechanisms. Now, one of the things that we tend to think of is loneliness is a stressor, so it means there's a big stress response. Nothing I've shown you is a surprise, except what I haven't shown you is loneliness is not associated with sympathetic or parasympathetic activation of the heart. Right? That's something in which I spent a decade studying, and we don't see that difference in loneliness. It's a hemodynamic effect, not a cardiodynamic effect. It's barely associated, if at all, with sympathetic adrenal medullary activation. The second, if you will, big major stress system. There are studies where catecholamines have been measured, and you see in the literature where loneliness is associated with higher epinephrine, we even seem to have a suggestion. It's a small effect if it's there at all. And many times you don't see it. Well, those of you who know catecholamines know that there's high variability, so that may not be too surprising. This included overnight urine samples that we've measured. So that if it's there, it's a very small effect. The effect that's big and that we see and others see is on the HPA axis. Higher morning levels of ACTH, higher morning rises, and flatter diurnal cycles. And that's what I have here is the morning rise in cortisol. We again measure all the possible uh, causes that I showed you. The two factors that were related were feeling uh, fatigued and feeling isolated and threatened. Those are the only ones like depressive symptoms, social support, not related to this morning rise. These were the two. And so we then turned this around. This is cross-sectional and we did the longitudinal analysis. And what we just found is the day before, so these, this is the same individual, right? The days in which you feel isolated the next morning, you show a greater rise in cortisol. 
That rise in cortisol doesn't predict how isolated you feel that next day. Feeling fatigued the day before doesn't predict the morning rise in cortisol. That morning rise predicts feeling less fatigued. Well, cortisol is a very powerful steroidal hormone that breaks down carbohydrates and fats to give you energy. That's why it's a stress hormone because it does mobilize you to deal with emergencies. And so this is not an unexpected effect. Well, we've looked at gene expression as well in uh, the last five years or so. We've started to focus on this in collaboration with Steve Cole at UCLA. And in the initial study, what we did was to take about seven high and seven low lonely individuals from the chaser sample, matched on as many things as we could, and we looked at gene expression because this was kind of an unfunded pilot that we did, and we found about 200 transcripts to differ. About 79 were upregulated in the lonely older adults, about 131 were underexpressed in these adults, and that, ex that exceeded the false discovery rate. We then looked uh, at these uh, transcriptional factor binding motifs using TELUS, a bioinformatics tool, and found a remarkably sensible pattern of data. You see it here, the glucocorticoid response element transcripts, those responsible for carrying cortisol signaling at the surface of the leukocytes to the nucleus, were downregulated in the lonely individuals. That is, it looked like they were showing glucocorticoid resistance. And if you look at cell distribution, it also looks like lonely individuals are becoming glucocorticoid resistant. One of the things the loneliness does is to break down fats and sugars to give you energy. Another thing it does is to control inflammation. And in the nucleus of the cell, the transcripts that are producing pro-inflammatory cytokines and uh, proteins are NF-kappa-B transcript family. And we see an upregulation of those in lonely, perhaps in large part because the cortisol signaling itself is being muted in those lonely individuals. So we get this leukocyte activation and inflammation and cellular responses to oxidative stress. Remember the fruit fly dies isolated because of oxidative stress. Remember the mouse? Oh, I didn't tell you this. Remember the mouse that had a larger infarct when it was individually housed? I forgot to tell you, if you block interleukin-6, the infarct doesn't grow larger. Interleukin-6 is a pro-inflammatory cytokine. Now, as we go up the species, so if you go to humans, it's not just interleukin-6, it's a much wider range, but you get this shift toward inflammatory biology. But we get also the down regulation is in type 1 interferon and antimicrobial responses. We know that it's perceived stress because we looked, it's not objective isolation, suggesting the role of the CNS. Now we also looked at depressive symptomatology, social support, hostility, you know, kind of the standard profile of ones that we look at as well. We then, thanks to NIE funding, were able to go back and look at everyone in the chaser sample who consented to have us use their gene data, and there was a sample of 93, and we replicated these results. The next question that we asked was, you have this whole family of leukocytes. Is it all of the cells that are being socially regulated, or are there subsets that are being regulated? And the reason we asked that question is there's two big families of pathogens. The oldest pathogen that kind of life had to deal with were bacteria, right? Bacteria live on their own. They preceded us in, in our cells. Fundamentally, we're built around bacterial. bacteria. But we also have to defend against bacteria. So the immune system developed in part to be able to defend against bacterial pathogens. Those things hang out on their own. If you're out on your own, engaged in something that gets you injured, that's a threat that you have to try to deal with. Viruses are another broad family, but viruses are not the same, are they? Viruses get transmitted through biological fluids. You don't catch them from a fence post that you scratch yourself on that no one's been around for days. Right? You catch it from shaking the hand of someone who just sneezed in their hand or walking through the spray of a sneeze in a subway or through sex or through other such means. It's by treating biological fluids. When are you likely to do that? Under socially affine conditions, right? And so indeed, the oldest cells in the immune system are the ones who are being regulated by feeling isolated. And if anything, here's our discovery sample, here's our larger confirmation sample. You see, feeling lonely is actually affecting the, limp, the um, B cells as well, but it's through downregulation. So basically what we're seeing here is a pattern of when one feels lonely, the immune system is adjusting to protect against bacterial infections and it's sacrificing some of the defense against viral infections. When you're in 
socially affine conditions. You feel connected, you anticipate being close to others, around others in the future as well. Then the immunity is shifting more toward viral defense away from bacterial defense. So it actually makes perfect sense. It also leads to a prediction which is not the one that led me to do this study in the first place. Remember, I suggested as you get older, these mechanisms, regulatory mechanisms, start to degrade. We thought glucocorticoid resistance might be more likely in older adults. So everything made sense up to this result. If this teleologic story I've just posed to you is true, we should find this same response in young adults as well as older adults, at least as strong as young adults, because evolution wasn't doing this to save the 87-year-olds. It was doing this to save the 25-year-olds. And so we, that by December, we will have the data collected from the younger part of the chaser sample now to test whether we get the same effect in our young adults and whether that's related to glucocorticoid resistance or glucocorticoid signaling at all. So this result is really quite exciting, but it also raises another question about what is the specific mechanism of this. Right now, we think it's cortisol, but that's also just a hypothesis, and we need to collect and finish this next portion to see if that's the fact. Finally, talked a little bit about contagion processes. I didn't want to leave without telling you that, yes, indeed, loneliness itself can be contagious. This was done in collaboration with uh, Nicholas Christakis and James Fowler, who have quantified social network data from the Framingham study. And uh, both uh, Nicholas and I are on the data monitoring board of the HRS study, thanks to Richard Sussman. And at one of those board meetings, uh, Nicholas said, have you ever looked at loneliness and the contagion? I said, no. He said, do you want to do that? And you're kind of like, throw me in the briar patch. Of course I want to do that. <laughs> and so, in fact, we did that. And what you see, the darker the dot, the, these are all the residents of Framingham. Each dot's a resident. The darker the dot, the lonelier the individual. And here's something that shocks no one. Loneliness is on the periphery, right? Here's the surprising part. Loneliness did not start at the periphery. Loneliness was just as likely to start as a yellow dot when people became lonely they moved to the periphery and they took their friends, their close friends, with them. All right. If you, and now if, uh, keep in mind though, the Framingham study, it's about every three to four years that you have a data point. All right? We're not talking about hourly, daily, or yearly. This is about every three to four years. So when I grow lonely and you're my neighbor who's my friend, three or four years later, we're less likely to be friends, you're 52% more likely to be lonely. All right? You as a friend of him, let's say I don't know you, you're about 26% more likely. You're about 10% more likely. And fortunately, you're not significantly more likely to be lonely. That's the finding, OK? Now, this is a joint probability. So the reason you get that descending is because it's not a perfect likelihood that you're going to be lonely, right? It's less than one. The likelihood you're going to be exposed to anything as a result of these people is the joint probability of everything that proceeded. So if you just take 0.5 and you go to the fourth, you're at close to chance already. So that's why you get this dampening effect as you go across people. What is the mechanism? One thing I know is it's not a statistical artifact. One of the covariates that I asked James, James ran these analyses. He's the one who does this social networking. I asked him to put in depressive symptomatology as a covariate because I was worried that all we were looking at was this transmission of depression. It didn't change the results, which really surprised me. It didn't change them at all. It changed some of the numbers. It didn't change any of the interpretations. didn't change anything of significance. And I was really stunned by that. If it was a statistical artifact, if some have been concerned, using that as a covariate with the same statistical features would have eliminated the effect. The second reason I think it's real, I can't say why obesity and other things are transmitted, are contagious. Loneliness, I think I can tell you. Because we've done an experience sampling study where we feed people. I mentioned that. Well, this is over a nine-day period. And basically, what we find is as I get lonely, I'm more likely to interact with you and my friend in a negative fashion. The more such negative interactions over a three to four year period, the less close we're likely to be. That's why I'm moving to the margins, right? Because even though I haven't geographically moved, I'm losing my friends because of how I'm acting toward them. You're more lonely because A, you lost me as a friend, and that what we found in this study was if somebody interacts with you negatively, you're more likely to interact with the next, or somebody else at the next beep in a more negative fashion as well. You know, that journal or that grant that's rejected has a bigger impact than the one that's accepted. <laughs> you know, you're going to be very happy when it's accepted, but it's due to you, right? When you get it's rejected, it's due to everybody else around you being nasty and mean. And you reciprocate. 
So the effects of negative interactions are greater than the effects of positive interactions, and you share that. And so that's the mechanism by which we think loneliness actually gets transmitted, and that's why it takes both proximity and time for this to get transmitted. Just want to point out that we've been doing this research now for about 20 years, but it has become a, a more popular target of investigation around the world. And there's a number of studies that are both replicating ours and that are showing other effects. There are now several studies, long-term studies, showing that loneliness predicts cognitive decline. And now two, one eight-year, one ten-year longitudinal study showing that it leads to uh, increases in Alzheimer's. One of those is by David Bennett and his group. And by the way, he looked at whether it's depression. It wasn't depressive symptomatology. It wasn't actual social interactions. It wasn't. It seemed to be this perceived isolation. It's not plaques and tangles. We visited him. He's looked at that. So he, he didn't know what it was. As we see more and more of these effects looking like loneliness contributes to inflammatory biology being adjusted, one can't help but wonder whether we're seeing in these Alzheimer developments the same thing that we see in the mice where the isolated mouse is showing greater inflammation and greater neural damage to a, uh, the same experimental infarct. It's just a hypothesis, but you see the kind of questions that are now starting to be asked in many different domains, not just the ones in which I've shown you. The other thing I wanted to point out is that loneliness is a stigmatized topic. I wrote a book called Loneliness, and you know, knew from my own uh, research that loneliness is something particularly men can't admit. So in none of the studies uh, in Chasers do we actually ask people, do, we f do you feel lonely? Because people will underreport, particularly men. Yeah, yeah, I knew that. I didn't actually feel it because it's kind of the scientific topic. Then I was on this book tour with this big white book with loneliness emblazoned across the front, going through airports and sitting it down next to me on the plane, right? And you start looking around, and then I understood what it meant to have a stigmatized topic. <laughs> and I turned the book over. But in fact, the effect size is large. So this is from a, uh, a meta-analysis published in the summer of 2010. Here's obesity. This is the effects on mor mortality across several conditions. Here's BMI, uh, alcohol consumption, uh, smoking cessation, smoking less than 15 cigarettes a day. Here's basically your social integration effects. So there are huge effects, and we simply aren't appreciating them in part because it seems like such a stigmatized problem, and in part because we thought lonely, those lonely people have brought it upon themselves, they're different. And what we have found is the effect sizes for longitudinal studies are as large as when we look cross-sectionally. It's actually something that's quite helpful to us as a species, as I suggested. It keeps us bonded. But if we're left in that state, just like if we're left in a chronic pain, hunger, or thirst state, there are deleterious consequences. So I would argue it's actually a health risk factor that we might want to attend to. And thank you very much for your time. I want very much to thank two groups. One is the National Institute of Aging, who has provided the support for most of the research about which I've spoken and much of what I've not had the time to talk about. And the second is the Village Internationally that has been working with us to show the kinds of things that, that uh, I was able to share with you today. So thank you very much. I'm happy to answer questions. Yes. Did you have a question? Yes, please. Thank you. Uh, I'm just curious um, about the issue of stigma, which is kind of an external imposed way of making, isolating somebody and making them lonely. And I wonder if there's any, if, if you look at the difference between uh, kind of a self-imposed loneliness from your own characteristics versus externally imposed. We've looked at the effects of culture, which is kind of the externally and uh, I'll tell you something that might sound surprising at first, and that is collectivist cultures. Italy, for instance, is lonelier than inde independent cultures like Finland or Netherlands or the US. Now, you might say, but they value connections. Why would that be? And then I'll ask you, when do you think people in the US are loneliest? Is it during the work week or is it at a holiday? Now, of course, it's obvious it's at the holidays. Why is it the holidays? It's because the cultural norm 
is that you're supposed to be with friends and family sharing the warmth of common bonds. And of course, if you feel lonely in that circumstance, it's anything but that. And so that heightens the intensity. It's even more stigmatized during that period. It's not that there are more lonely people in collectivist cultures. It's that the pain associated with that separation is greater when you're in that, in that condition. And so that's a, kind of another effect of this feeling stigmatized, feeling that you're that different, you're not enjoying what it is that you're supposed to be as, as a member of that society. Now, I would also say, you know, sometimes people ask about this. If hunger were as stigmatized as loneliness, I think we'd have a lot more anorexics because we would feel like we can't, to do something about it is to admit it. And so I think that's one of the real dangers of the stigma. Yes. Yeah. But it also sounds like you're saying that it should be socially so yeah. a mixture. Yeah. We've, we've done twin studies with Dorette Boomsma, and she's the director of the Netherlands Twin Register. I, I didn't bother to show those data, but we now have a series of twin studies that we've done. Loneliness in adults is about 50% heritable and non-common environmental. In children, there's a common environmental component. The heritability is a little less. Um, as you know, heritability changes across time. What's being inherited is not a feeling of loneliness, though. We've argued it's the intensity of the pain, of the pain from social connection, from social disconnection, pardon me. And the best evidence we have for that comes from Myron Hoffer. He looks at maternal distress in rat pups, and he finds individual variability, right? Some scream loudly, some scream relatively softly. You want that genetic variance because those who scream loudly are more likely to be discovered by their mothers and therefore, if you will, um, found, protected, nurtured, survived. But predators also hear rat pups crying, and so they're more likely to be found by predators as well. So whether that's, quote, adaptive depends on the predator density in the environment. So that variability is actually very good for the species. What he then did was to take loud crying and soft crying rat pups and selectively bred them for 25 generations. He then looked at what do those adult rats look like. They look very much like our adult humans. Greater cortisol, more kind of depressive behavior, more withdrawal, more anxiety, uh, and one other that look like our humans. So it looks, that's, that's like I said, not perfect, but that's the best evidence that I have that it's this sensitivity, not loneliness per se. The other part, though, is that we see longitudinally, you might have slightly different intercepts, but most people go up and down in loneliness across years. They're not, the uh, test retest is about 0.75 for a one year, and it's about 0.72 for a five and 10 year period. So you get a lot of vacillation, you know, across a year to year, but it's staying in kind of that same order of magnitude change. So I consider it both, yes. John. John, have you looked at uh, uh, this as an explanation or a mechanism for uh, the effect of uh, widowhood on mortality risk? Um, we have just looked at marriage. So Linda and we have been working with the HRS data on marriage. And I think I, I summarized what we found with that. Um, we have not looked at widowhood yet. The change your sample isn't that old. We could with the HRS. We just haven't done it. It's a great suggestion. We have started to look at retirement. And actually, that's, we've got a paper we just finished, and we, it was so surprising and interesting. Retirement's different than age. I mean, it, you know, there's this confound, but we're finding dramatic effects just from retirement. And here's a surprise. Loneliness goes down when you retire, temporarily. But it actually goes down. Whether you stay less lonely depends on what you do after that. And partly what it depends on is if you stay in contact with the community, stay in contact with coworkers, loneliness remains low. If you stop doing that, if you deal with kind of this new life by watching TV, social networking alone, then, then loneliness starts to climb again. And of course, health status also is a factor there. So health, loneliness is both predicting steeper declines in health, but it's also that health and particularly disabilities are feeding back onto the loneliness. If you're more disabled, can't get out, then you're also becoming lonelier. So both that, it starts to have a reciprocal effect after retirement in particular. Yes? You brought up social networking. I'm curious about the effect of social networking. Yeah. 
Yeah, that's a great question. I'm going to answer both of those in kind of the same breath. The effect, the, the simple effect, okay, if you, if you don't read the literature in a nuanced fashion, uh, the more friends you have on Facebook, you know, the more likely you are to do social networking, uh, the less lonely you're, the less lonely you are. However, it really depends on what you're doing with it. If you're isolated due to some chronic disease, disability, or you have a spouse with Alzheimer's or some dementia that means you're housebound as well, social networking has been a boon because some connection is better than nothing. If you, as you well know, caretakers tend to show big increases in perceived stress, diminutions in immunity, increases in isolation, increases in depression. These kinds of contacts are better than nothing for that group. That's a small group in the population, but it's non-trivial. That's part of the answer. For the rest, it depends how you're using it. If you're using it to leverage face-to-face, -face, then loneliness goes down. And that's what most of the population is doing. If you're using it as a substitute, which is what the very lonely are doing, then it's like eating celery. It feels good momentarily, but there's nothing nutritious about it. <laughs> and it ends up making you feel more lonely and more depressed over time. And so that's, it, that's the, the more subtle effect. Now I have to say, in our older adult sample, there's, there's not enough social networking that we're seeing that. We're not seeing anything because of the low frequency. We're talking about the new cohorts that's coming up where social networking is part of their life. Those, in fact, I'm, I'm teaching a course on loneliness this quarter. And one of the students captured it beautifully. He said he came from a small town. Everybody else in his town, all his friends stayed close to that town. He came to Chicago. He's going to the University of Chicago. He said he was on Facebook watching what his friends were doing, and he got terribly lonely at Chicago. And he realized he had to get off Facebook. He had to turn it off and turn around and start making new friends at Chicago. And that's, so that's exactly the kind of case we see where social networking leads to increases. It's when it substitutes and as a consequence, you look back and see what everybody, you know, what you see on Facebook is what you're not enjoying. And that is all these rich connections if you're using it as a substitute. Yes? Well, given the difficulty in measuring loneliness or emotion generally in non-human animals, yeah. I'm wondering what you see, how you see the way forward. The yeah, that's a, great, that's a great question. So what we've been doing is just, you know, if you isolate the animal, you say, well, it's roughly the same thing. The nice thing about rhesus monkeys, so this is John Capitanio, who's the head, the research director at the California National Primate Center. He's the person with whom we're collaborating on this. I flew out there, we looked at the rhesus monkeys, they have 5,000 of them. He's behaviorally characterized several hundreds now. You know, he, he looked, he's describing the behavioral patterns of these animals. Honestly, they just look like furry balls of energy. I can't tell the difference. It takes a primatologist, right? I mean, so they see things in those animals I don't see. But he can characterize, people can look at it as temporally stable ways of responding. And he basically argues there's three categories. There are highly integrated animals. They have lots of contact. Lots of people are grooming them. They're grooming lots of people. Lots of primates are grooming them. They're, gro priming, they're grooming lots of primates. There's another group who's just isolated. Don't interact very often with other animals. There's a third group who walks toward animals and then walks away and does that a lot. And his notion was that that's the loneliest group. He thought the isolated and the one that has a lot of interactions were non-lonely. So we then went back and behaviorally characterized our humans in the chaser study the same way. And we found out that this group that was alone was intermediate in loneliness. I worried that there was a bimodal, there isn't. They're intermediate in loneliness, so we had this continuity. We have more recently been doing, doing fairly sophisticated cluster analyses and we find temporally stable types. There's actually four, not three. And so we're working with John to get the data we need so we can do the same analyses on his monkeys to see the typology. So that's actually how we're trying to get at the loneliness in the, the chimps, excuse me, in the rhesus monkeys, is by using our primate data and his primate data using exactly the same, if you will, input data and statistical techniques, and then seeing what our primates say and imputing that into his rhesus monkeys. Once we've done that, the next step is to look at the gene transcripts. And if we get a parallel in the gene transcripts as well, then we're going to say we've, we think we have a really good animal model. So that's the idea. Richard. Yeah. And yeah. Time use yeah. And what the issue of people who are either socially isolated or people who are surrounded by people yeah. who feel lonely. Have there been any attempts to collect 
loneliness by time use in large, in large samples? Well, we've done the experience sampling, but we've also looked at loneliness and subjective well-being in the chasers data, both cross-sectionally and longitudinally. What cross-sectional data show you is who's feeling lonely and who's feeling happy or sad. What longitudinal tells you is why. And so in the longitudinal, we find income, age, and loneliness to be the variables that are related to subjective well-being that are also related to it longitudinally. All right? If you look cross-sectionally, you also find a lot of personality factors. Right? That's not very surprising, but personality factors aren't changing over time in a way that relates to subjective well-being. When we look at those longitudinally, though, subjective well-being is leading to loneliness. Loneliness is leading to lower subjective well-being. So that's a strong reciprocal. The effect of subjective well-being on loneliness is longer. Again, using case-based matching, that's a two-year effect. The effect of loneliness and subjective well-being is a one-year effect. The income is the consequence, not the antecedent. And age is independent. Looks like a Laura Carstensen effect, but it's independent of those, the cost of the other variables. Interventions. interventions? So that's, you mean for loneliness? Yeah. yeah, no, that's a great question. We have been compelled by Richard to start thinking about that question. And what we have in press now is a meta-analysis of all those studies done to lower loneliness. Uh, there are 53 such studies. There are three designs, pre-post, um, matched control group and randomized clinical trials. Most of the randomized clinical trials because of the file draw problem, if you look at pre-post, the effect size is fairly large. It's about a 0.5 effect size um, and loneliness seems to work. Uh, excuse me, intervention seemed to work. Now, what kind of intervention? There's a lot of different kinds in those 53, but there are four major categories. There is uh, providing social support, going in and working with the person, giving them what they need, talking to them. There is uh, social engagement. The idea is these are the inaccurate notion, I didn't say this, but loneliness and isolation, physical isolation are actually unrelated. Um, the idea though is that if loneliness is just being alone, put them with other people. College freshmen have seen this. If you remember your freshman year, you probably in the first week of college went to a mixer where you were there with a lot of other isolated freshmen, right? Well, you probably talked to the people around you and felt isolated talking to them and looked out and saw everybody else talking to someone and said, see, this is proof. I'm the only isolate here. Because it looks like everybody else has friends. So that doesn't actually work very well. In fact, when you put lonely people together, given I, what I said about how they tend to interact, it, looks, it starts out well and it falls off the rails. So that doesn't work very well. But in this pre-post, you see an effect. The third kind is uh, social, uh, social skills training. When you're talking about adults, they have social skills. It's the um, getting concerned about your own self-preservation, not thinking about other people that make those social skills not as well deployed when you feel lonely. Uh, if you're trained in social skills, there's a beneficial effect on loneliness um, in the pre-post. Same for the randomized clinical, non-randomized clinical trials. The effect size is about the same, but of course there are these confounds in each. When you look at the clinical trials, interventions. The fourth kind starts up here and it's social cognition behavior therapy. Trying to get you to think differently about other people. Getting outside of yourself and starting to think about the other person as well. Uh, and what we find there is heterogeneity. There's, a, there's an effect that's significant. Heterogeneity. The first three that I mentioned, the effect size is about 0.19 on average. About. It's about 0.2 on average. Uh, the effect size for the social cognition behavior therapy 0.6. Now, there aren't many such studies, so I think we're going to see it's smaller than 0.6, but it's, I think it's going to remain higher than the other three for the reasons that we've talked about today. We actually are working on an intervention with the Army uh, right now to see what we can do about some of the problems that they're suffering. And the idea, the reason, the motivation for doing that was A, because General Cornum came in and convinced me, and she's a pretty impressive person if you've ever met her. And second is, if we can succeed there, then we can translate that into older adults. And that's actually our ultimate goal. And so uh, that's the plan. But it's going to be, I think we're going to find it to be a tough nail. And I think the uh, getting at this way in which they're looking at other people is going to be the route to go, not these other methods. Yes?
Yeah, yeah. And also another question. Is, yeah. For all the, are we inducing like an early death for people who come to prison? Yeah, that's a great, yeah, that's an interesting question. So the, the first part of your question, most of the data I've showed you, we don't pick lonely people. We are doing population-based research. So the sample in Chasers is population-based. It's everybody that we can get you know, from a random sample. I mean, when, you know, when you draw this sample, you would knock on doors, because if they're on your list, you really, really need to get them in your study. So we do everything we can to get a representative sample. And ours are the metropolitan Chicago area. Cook County is our, our survey area. Uh, in the Ohio State study, we did it on one assessment. It's when they first came in. We tested 5,500 kids, and we took top and bottom quintiles. We took the middle quintile as well, so we could see if it was linear. It is. Uh, and uh, followed them. And when you take quintiles, there's some regression to the mean due to measurement error, but there's not any crossover. So that's how we selected that particular. But that's actually the only sample we ever pre-selected. Um, are we inflicting morbidity and mortality on those we isolate? There was a National Geographic documentary on solitary confinement. They spent about a week in my lab, and I refused to actually generalize to people who get assigned solitary confinement because we don't, you know, I mean, that's a very different potential population. Now, the Terry Andersons, who were, you know, was captured and was isolated for seven years, that's different. We can generalize to individuals of that kind, but the people who are put in solitary confinement, they, they're not a random sample. And just to give you an idea, I said loneliness, I think, is important for humanity. Consider why variance in that dimension is important. People who have very little pain of social disconnection are the ones who are likely to be explorers. We need that. We need people who are willing to go over the hill, who are willing to go out, like Lewis and Clark, but who care enough about the connections they left that they're going to come back at some point, right? <laughs> but we need others who are so pained by that disconnection that they're going to sit and defend against all comers, right? That variance is really good for us. There are perhaps some who have no pain of disconnection. I don't know. I actually have never looked at a clinical population, but I would posit psychopaths may have the least pain of disconnection, and they may be the most likely to end up in solitary confinement. So I actually, when I say I don't want to generalize, there's actually a reason. It's based on no evidence, but I'm just timid about generalizing to that population because they're not the representative sample we've tried to study. We haven't studied prisoners. And I, I think you know, there's, there's a very different, the, the answer to the question of do we know how long they've been lonely? Yes, because we've measured them now for 10 years. Now, you, know, you can ask them how long they've been lonely. I don't actually trust those reports. So that's the reason the longitudinal. And actually in this intervention study that I hope to come to you sometime, and I age sometime and propose, we will use the chaser sample, the whole age range, and randomly assign half to the intervention and half to an active control group. And then we will have strong longitudinal data from a host of levels of organization that we can look at. And that's, that to me is really kind of an exciting possibility looking forward. Yes? Any, any data on religious communities joining uh, yeah. pastors and nuns? Or? No, not for, again, with the population base, but we have looked at religious beliefs. One of the things we find is um, if I, so loneliness increases anthropomorphism. Anthropomorphism of gadgets, anthropomorphism of pets, anthropomorphisms of celestial bodies, anthropomorphism of God. So we randomly assign people to lonely and non-lonely conditions. Okay, we experimentally make one half of this group feel lonely, right? And we ask, how much do you believe in God? The stunning thing is that most Americans believe in God. Go figure. If you make them lonely, it goes up. Even though it's a high number, it's significantly higher if you, if you make them feel lonely, which really is kind of interesting. Same for gadgets, so same for, uh, we took pictures of the Creb Nebula, Nebula, and we went to Grants Park, which is downtown Chicago, and we did an experiment on the campus. So in the Grants Park, we correlated how much they said that the Crab Nebula had a, had a mind with their loneliness, it was positively correlated. Now, we asked also how much animacy did it have, a non-human disposition. It didn't differ by loneliness, okay? Same thing when we randomly assigned people and we did an experiment. When we did a brain imaging of that particular phenomena, we found the same area that activates when you think about yourself 
activated when you're anthropomorphizing gadgets. So the reason it's not beneficial is because, you know, talking to yourself is not the same as talking to other people. Yes? Yeah. 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 So I can actually talk about both of the to both directions. There's animal studies done showing, for instance, with cancer, that uh, loneliness increases tumor growth in rats that have that are pro tumor producing. What's the name for that? Anyway, so, so you have some evidence that loneliness may contribute to that. Um, in the AARP study, which is this national sample, uh, they looked at disease conditions and loneliness, and in most disease, chronic diseases, loneliness was higher. In cancer, loneliness was lower. It might be due to the social support groups that exist for cancer patients at this time. Um, you know, there, there wasn't enough data to be able to tell. But that was the only disease condition in which loneliness was actually lower in those cancer in those patients than in the other chronic diseases. How about the effects of loneliness or the relationship between loneliness and the symptoms of all of these chronic conditions? And the reason I asked about the inclination is because I thought maybe. Well, lonely individuals, we didn't do this research, but it, uh, others did it. Loneliness is associated with higher frequency of going to physicians. And I've started to talk to medical audiences, and the physicians in the audience say, oh, yeah. I mean, they all are aware of this, evidently. Um, we did a study looking at heart attack victims in an ER. And you know, there's this protein analysis you can do to determine how much myocardial damage was actually done. And they ask you to do a pain rating. And what we found in that study was that if they came into the hospital alone, that is, the, you know, the ambulance delivered them alone, uh, the pain ratings were significantly higher than if they were accompanied by anyone. We just, because this is all a medical record, right? So it's a medical record, but if they had somebody on record with them, their pain ratings were lower, but the protein uh, indicating myocardial damage was comparable for the two groups. So there does seem to be uh, some buffering, if you will, of symptomatology by feeling less lonely. That's an inference, not a finding from that. That's in my interpretation of that. I think my time is up. Any more burning questions? Before we wrap up, I want to take the opportunity to thank uh, Sarah Johnson and Tish Wiley is sitting here also, or fellows who have been putting together this lecture series. Actually, Sarah did all the hard work putting this together today. Also, Ron Abel is sitting up here, who is a recently retired member of our group at OBSSR, now a photographer par excellence. Uh, <laughs> been responsible for this for, for several years, so thank you. And John, thank you for a wonderful talk. Thank you true. very much. Thank you.